So as you know, the IGF has um, there's been an effort to make this year's meeting more focused on selecting three themes. And as part of the themed approach being used with uh, IGF 2019, the MAG decided to introduce new introductory and concluding sessions for each of the three themes. The thinking was um, that at the start of the week, we'd be able to set the scenes for the various sessions that are taking place during the week, um, being organized by different parts of the community. And to then come back at the end of the week and share insights gained on the various issues around data governance. And um, so there are various MAG members who are going to be assisting me today and some other volunteers. Um, my MAG colleague, Lucien Castex from Internet Society uh, France is going to be moderating the session on Friday and has been working with me on this. And I also have volunteers from the MAG and a couple of other people um, who've also agreed to volunteer who will lead breakout sessions um, later in the meeting. Um, so you come to this session because you're interested in the broad topic of, of data governance. So I'll just say a little bit about this theme, but I'll, I'll save most of that for our keynote speaker. Um, the MAG framed this theme around the basic question of, of how we can ensure the benefits of the data revolution while also ensuring that the rights of people are protected. And we noted that the global nature of the internet and the transfer of digital information across borders brings an international dimension to discussions around data. And we suggested that the, the generation, the collection, and the processing data of data have enabled new social, cultural, and economic opportunities, but they also pose challenges around privacy, around freedom of expression, and the exercise of other human rights. So we, we hope that the theme would enable rich discussions about how to ensure the development of human-centric data governance frameworks, how to empower individuals in their digital identity, and how to create the conditions to facilitate data-driven innovation, while at the same time ensuring competition and fostering trust in the development of, of new services and new technologies. So you can see there on the screen the agenda. Um, but we hope that this session would help people to learn more about the sessions in areas of particular personal interest that are going to be taking place this week. Um, so when you go into the breakout sessions and when we have the discussion at the end, you might hear from people who are organizing some of those workshops and open forums. Um, and, and you may have a chance then to connect with or, or um, or, or learn about others who are working on issues that are of interest to you. And the MAG wanted to make this interactive, so in the second part of the session, um, after our keynote speaker, we're going to split into th six breakout groups. I'm going to come back um, to how that will work after we hear from our keynote speaker. So to kick off the session and to provide her insights on this broad to topic, we are very fortunate to have uh, Marie-Laure Denis. She's the, um, the president of CNIL, La Commission Nationale de l'Informatique et des Libertés, um, National Commission on Informatics and Liberty, which is, serves as the French Data Protection Authority. Madame uh, Denis has held a number of senior roles in both uh, government ministries and at uh, the regulatory bodies which oversee the audiovisual sector, uh, the communication sector, and the energy sector in France. And in February of this year, she was appointed as the president of CNIL, she kindly agreed to come and help set the scene for this week's various discussions on data governance by sharing her perspectives on this very hot topic. So, um, Madame Lenny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, it is an honor for me to be in front of you today, and let me start by warmly thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to introduce the discussions we, you will have this week on data governance. The theme is vast, the challenges are numerous, and the stakes are high. Data governance is also multi-layered and cannot be isolated from the elements that it impacts, our society, our economy, and ultimately our future. Whether we speak about data collection, data flow, or data sharing, the very structure of our digital ecosystem has profound implications. 
data governance is not only about data, but very often about personal data. I should indeed also start with a little disclaimer. As you will have noticed, I'm from France, a founding country of the European Union, and I'm the head of an independent data protection authority. My introduction today will therefore reflect the back this background, and you might hear the word GDPR a few times in my contribution. But I wanted to make today's introduction a starting point for your talks, which of course should go much beyond the sole issue of regulating personal data. My aim is to set the scene, ask questions, and trigger discussions. I'm not going to give you a lecture. Instead, I'm going to get the ball rolling with three main messages. First, the status of personal data in our society and our economy has changed, not only at the European level, but also at a global level. Second, sustainable data governance cannot exist without personal data protection. And finally, beyond data governance, digital sovereignty is also at stake. To start with, I would like to emphasize my first message. The status of personal data in our economy and our society has changed, and it can no longer be seen solely as a regulatory issue. Data-driven businesses represent an increasingly important part of our current economy in the European Union and worldwide. The market value of personal data was estimated at 315 billion euros in 2012 against 1 trillion euros in 2020. Over the past decade, we have seen companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google, or Alibaba become multinational giants with a business model relying on the collection and monetization of users' personal data. And whether you are in Ottawa, Bamako, or Paris, everybody now uses smartphones, shops online, and interacts through social media. Personal data are the core of new practices and usages which are now global, and privacy concerns are also, has also become global. Our duty is to ensure that this growth is sustainable and respects fundamental rights. This concept is reflected in Article 1 of the French Data Protection Law. Information technology should be at the service of every citizen. Its development shall take place in the context of international cooperation. It shall not violate human identity, human rights, privacy, or individual or public liberties. And this was written in 1978. The digital revolution is a great opportunity, but it also comes with fears, negative consequences on our economies, our societies, and even on our lifestyles. Personal data can even be a powerful weapon to target people with a view to interfere with our democratic systems, as we have seen it in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Social media targeting may even be used for foreign interference purposes. We have seen individual profiling used as a tool to influence our behavior, our consumer habits, and ultimately such processes impact individuals' rights to self-determination. Apple CEO said, Tim Cook said last year at a privacy conference in Brussels that the crisis is real. This immediate crisis is that a feeling of loss of control over personal data, but also more generally of the potential for data and technologies to rip apart the social fabric of how society works, as stated by a former for, uh, Facebook employee. This data crisis is not just a crisis of confidence in the use of personal data. It is the feeling that an entire digital society is being built without us. That this digital society is making choices regarding freedoms, organizations, political vision, and that we are no longer master of these choices. Some are saying that the data is the new oil of our economy. We hear talk about data monetization to the benefit of users, suggestions that we should be able to sell out our personal data. Yet, at the same time, we see a growing social demand for more privacy protection and more control and user empowerment. Personal data 
alone are actually not that valuable. It's their collection, aggregation, and combination that brings value. What we need to pay particular attention to is how personal data are accessed, collected, and enhanced, and how individuals can keep the upper hand in such processing with a view to prevent a disastrous oil spill. Taking these new economic, societal, and technological developments into account, the European Union has updated its legal framework for data protection with one key premise at the starting point, Personal data are not assets like any other. To, they relate to individuals empower, empowered with specific rights. There is a European conception of personal data, which is probably not limited to the European Union territory, but which is essential to understand how we see data governance and privacy. That being said, the European model, our vision, is not the only one. And when it comes to data governance, let's not be naive. We should not hide the fact that conflicting models exist at the international level. I will come back to this at the end of my speech. The question that arises here, and which we should reflect on, is how to reach consensus at the international level in order to agree on a common vision and status for personal data as part of personal data discussion. This brings me to my second message. There can't be any sustainable data governance vision without a strong personal data protection component and its base. For us, data governance means rules for how personal data can be handled and processed. And GDPR truly puts the individual at the center of digital regulation. As such, it strengthens existing citizens' rights, such as the requirements for consent, and codifies new ones, such as the right to data port portability, which is a new right uh, that comes with the GDPR. It is also clear that the European regulation aims at rebalancing the current asymmetrical relationship between the individual and those who process its data, and also seeks to prevent the concentration of European citizens' data within large databases. From where I stand, sustainable data governance should primarily take into account the fact that when it comes to personal data, we are here to uphold a fundamental right. This is a legal requirement, but also translates the, so the societal demand for greater data protection and privacy. Data, government, data governance should indeed address citizens' and consumers' expectations when it comes to the use and processing of their personal data and ultimately align with our values and societal aspirations. If we do not respond to these demands, if we do not act through concrete and effective decisions, we cannot collectively keep the upper hand over our own future. Let me, me, let, let, let me be more concrete here and take the example of children's personal data. This is an issue of growing concern, but also a question of governance model and values. Defining a sustainable data governance framework also means setting limits on the processing of children's personal data in our digital ecosystem. In this regard, this year we are celebrating, as you know, the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We have here a common framework upon which we should probably build to further integrate the right of the child into our digital environment. The CNIL intends to play a role in these reflections and wants to foster discussions in this area. Last week, at the UNESCO, the President Emmanuel Macron also announced key priorities and concrete actions in 2020 in order to uphold the rights of the child, including a future international policy declaration on protecting, protecting children in the digital era with a strong emphasis on personal data and privacy. Another example of where data governance implies growing a line, taking into account political and ethical considerations, is the use of biometric data, and in particular of facial recognition. We should indeed make clear that data governance cannot mean abandoning all legal requirements. 
On the contrary, it is also about defining certain boundaries and drawing red lines on the use and processing of personal data. It calls for political choices and needs to be addressed at national, regional and international level. The most appropriate to act effectively through binding instruments. At the international level, we should aim at drawing up common principles which should set the common grounds for such frameworks. Going back to practical implementation, in addition to complying with the applicable legal frameworks, it is also essential that data-driven businesses understand that data protection can no longer be confined within the legal departments. It must be integrated in processes and strategies throughout the organization. From product development to process management, data protection and privacy by design, must become key concepts. Let me also stress here that protecting personal data within an organization also means in ensuring the security of personal data. That's where personal data protection can enhance cybersecurity. This relationship can also actually go both ways when we think about issues such as encryption or information security. Technological innovations such as AI make this new paradigm of data governance even more crucial and relevant. We need to move from data protection as a legal requirement to data protection as a core component of data, protect, of data governments, encompassing the whole data cycle within an organization. This is true from a microeconomic point of view, but also from a macroeconomic one. Data protection regulation can no longer be seen in an isolation from other fields of regulation applying to the digital economy. Data protection considerations now factor into the assessments of competition regulators. A similar calculation also occurs in the other direction as data protection regulation, uh, regulators are faced with new cases resulting from market evolutions and competition cases. The new reality of our economies makes it essential that regulators talk to each other and beyond simply talking, that they actually cooperate with each other. In order to address the challenges ahead, what we need is to build bridges among regulators and have the mechanism in place for a more systematic and long-lasting cooperation. To sum up the second point, and uh, you can relax, there are only three points, but to sum up the second point, the second message, I would again end with a question for you to address in your upcoming discussions. How can data governance help us keep the upper hand over technological development and big tech companies? Or in other words, how can data governance better integrate ethical and legal requirements in order to uphold our values and protect individuals' rights? This question brings me to my last message for you today. Data governance is certainly not only a European issue. The challenges are global and must be addressed internationally. Our globalized economy has gone digital and de facto international trade relies more and more on data transfers, mainly personal data transfers. Our digital ecosystem is no longer confined to regional areas, but has to be apprehended globally. It is therefore essential that data governance is addressed from an international point of view. I note here that the EU represents a significant market for digital trade and online services, a situation which could give the Union some privacy leverage in upholding and promoting its model. And the message from us should be clear. There can't be a free flow of personal data without appropriate data protection safeguards. In addition to these necessary safeguards supporting data flow, as well as the vital need to maintain an open internet, issues such as government access, surveillance, and localization have become a growing concern. They cannot be ignored, and they raise the question of ensuring individuals' rights while data are now moving swiftly from one jurisdiction to other. This is a significant challenge, which should lead us to redefine the concept of sovereignty and perimeter. 
Addressing global data governance should lead us to consider digital sovereignty. We should not be naive about the current situation and must instead state the reality of our world today. When it comes to data governments, there is a clash of regulatory models, which quite often reflects divergence in values and societal models. I am here advocating for the European model enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU and based on the European humanist heritage. But ours is not the only one, and issues such as international data flow and government access have actually become core components at the international level. We should not ignore these issues and must address them through a multilateral approach, since diverging data governance models can also significantly impact internet freedom and more generally human rights in the digital era. Upholding our model is also a question of influence. That's why the French Data Protection Authority, CNIL, has placed data diplomacy as one of the key priorities in its strategic plan. We consider it necessary to establish data governance at the international level that can ensure the digital sovereignty of the EU and ultimately protect individual rights. We must remain open in pursuing this objective. There is no fortress Europe when it comes to digital matters, and there should not be. What we need is to ensure that the different data governance models can actually talk to each other and interact with undermining our common values. I'm definitely convinced that when it comes to data governance at the global level, a multilateral approach is the appropriate way forward. And the Internet Governance Forum is a great example of how we can address common challenges together. But we will certainly not be creative to reinvent regulatory cooperation at the international level and to work on defining common principles that can pave the way for a sustainable data governance worldwide. When it comes to data protection, I want to mention the modernized Council of Europe Convention 108. Convention 108 plus today is the only existing international data protection instrument open to countries outside Europe. We strongly support this updated international convention, which can be, in our view, a step towards greater convergence at the international level in the field of personal data protection. Independent data protection authorities are also coming together within our international network, the ICD-PPC, which has now become uh, the Global Privacy Assembly. Together, we have adopted a new policy strategy aimed at making our voice better heard in the global debate of data governance. We have embarked on a quiet, ambitious journey, and the adoption of global data protection standards is certainly a long-term objective. But we want to prove that through a multilateral and multi-stakeholder approach, we can bring answers to these international challenges. The last question I would therefore leave to you is the following. How can we improve multilateral dialogue in order to establish a sustainable and global data governance framework? To conclude, I would like to emphasize the essential link between personal data protection and other fundamental rights. It is particularly true when we talk about internet governance and online freedom. As regulators, we do act with a permanent attention in this regard, and it is therefore essential that all stakeholders keep this critical imperative in mind when discussing and addressing the challenges of data governments. I thank you for your attention and hope you will have fruitful discussions this week, which for sure will uh, represent valuable input for future endeavors. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much to, to Madame Denis there for, for kicking us off this week on data governance, um, for asking us some questions, um, and for also sharing her views with us. Um, I'm just going to see if we have any single question. I think we've got time for maybe one question if a hand pops up, otherwise we'll, we'll move on to the breakout session and 
So let's, let's uh, take with us the questions that Madame Denis has, has left with us, and um, let's take those forward into our discussions now. So thank you again, Madame Denis. Okay. Um, if we could have the slide back, thank you. So that concludes the first part of our discussion. And um, I mentioned how the community had come up with a wide range of, of sessions looking at different aspects of data governance. So within the MAG, uh, we tried to find ways to sort them into different sub-themes. Um, we came up with these six buckets. So I'm not saying these are the only six uh, issues around data governance, but these seem to be um, sub-themes that reflected the various sessions that uh, have been organized by the community for IGF 2019. Now, the next slide shows you all of the various sessions on data governance uh, in Berlin and where we thought they best fitted within the six sub-themes. Indeed, ideally, the, the organizers of, of all of these sessions are here today and they can take part in the breakout discussions. Obviously, the, the print is very small. Uh, there are a lot of sessions, and they, they uh, only fit into a slide at a certain font size. Um, but if you can spot the number of your workshop or a workshop that you're speaking in or are particularly interested in, then that might give you a hint of uh, which breakout session you would like to join. Now, each breakout session will look at three policy questions. And to come up with three policy questions, we looked at and we drew from every policy question that was pro provided in the description of, of every session that's on this slide. Okay, so this is the first time we've done this kind of uh, breaking out introductory session. Um, I'm very happy to have six volunteers who will moderate the breakout sessions. Uh, they will in turn be looking for volunteers to act as note takers or rapporteurs and to be able to report back on the discussions when we return to the room uh, for the final session in about 35 minutes. So the session will close with reports back from each breakout group to the full room. Uh, we hope that this session helps people to learn more about the sessions in areas of particular personal interest that are gonna be taking place this week um, and, and potentially helping you to connect with others working on these issues. Um, here are our six breakout groups with our six um, moderators. Um, and what I'd like to do now, so you really do have to bear with us because it's the first time we've done this, but when we came into the room this morning, it appeared that um, the layout of the room uh, had naturally provided six breakout areas with those chairs that are, are behind the central table. Um, and so what I've asked to, the, the moderators to do is to position themselves near each of these um, six areas. I wonder if the moderators could stand up so that everyone can see who they are. So we have um, Chennai Chair on my left from the Web Foundation, uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle in the middle from Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, um, Miguel Candia from uh, the Paraguayan government, Maria Paz Canales uh, from Derechos Digitales, and then this is not um, Zhu Wangzhu um, from UNDESA. It is his colleague, uh, Wai Min, who has um, been able to stand in at the last moment. Thank you, Wai Min. And then finally, we have uh, Conchettina Casa from the Agency for Digital Italy. So I know there will be a little bit of uh, disruption as, as we transition now, but um, these six people are standing in front of the blocks of chairs which will make up the areas for you to have your breakout discussions. So it might mean people need to move around the room and surrender their chair, um, but I'd ask you now to pick um, one of these breakout groups. So if I go around the room again, Conchettina here to my right is leading the breakout session on human rights and internet ethics. In the middle, uh, Wai Min is leading the breakout session on data and sustainable development. And at the end of the room on my right is Maria Paz Canales, who's leading on human rights and inter-ethics. 
Uh, to my left, Chennai is leading the session on data protection framework, so that'll be in the left corner here. In the left and the middle um, with Bertrand is jurisdictional and sovereignty issues. And then finally, in that top corner, is cross-border data with Miguel. Thank you, and I will call you back to the full room in about 35 minutes.
This is your one minute warning. This is your one minute warning. Okay, um, if we could all return back to the full room now and um, look forward to hearing what each of the sessions are discussed. Thank you.
Okay, if we, if we could return to the, um, to the table and to our seats, and we will hear back from what's been going on around the room. Thank you. OK, so thank you. We, we have um, about half an hour left. And um, it, it's clear that there have been lots of discussions going on around the room. The breakout sessions seem to have worked quite well. I'm personally interested to hear back um, how the discussions went and, and any insights you have. We will um, be coming back on Friday. And we will follow the same kind of uh, approach of breaking out into these six groups, and, and then hearing back um, what insights have been learned through the week from the sessions that have taken place on these issues, and feeding those into these same policy questions. So um, it could be interesting, ultimately, at the end of conference to be able to compare uh, what we hear back now from you and what we end up hearing at the end of the week. So. Uh, we have the, the slide up there with the six groups, and it's obviously just simplest to, to work down through the groups um, one at a time. So what I'd like to do is um, I'll ask the, the breakout moderator from each group to, um, to introduce their rapporteur, and, and then we'll hear back from, the, from each session. And then if we've got time at the end, um, we'll also have some discussion too. So, um, Miguel, could I ask uh, you to kick the ball off with the cross-border data group? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, and um, thank you for me giving me the floor, and, and good morning to everybody. We, uh, we had the cross-border data uh, breakout group, and uh, we had a, a fantastic discussion for, uh, with a very diverse uh, points of view and opinions, and I will... Uh, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Lawrence Kay, who was our rapporteur. Lawrence, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, and uh, yeah, hello to everyone. I'm Lawrence Kay from the Open Data Institute in London, uh, founded by Tim Berners-Lee, and we work on data in international trade. Uh, we had a great and really diverse group um, with lots of really interesting opinions from around the world, people in, in different circumstances with different uh, problems that they were interested in. Um, we essentially discussed uh, different ways in which to think about uh, uh, regulating, doing policy for data uh, internationally. Uh, so we had a rich discussion about um, sort of national issues and uh, the different preferences uh, that uh, citizens around the world in different countries might have for um, influencing data policy and whether that's at the national or international level and uh, issues around privacy, but also issues around um, other aspects of sort of uh, being a citizen in, a di in the digital world and how that, uh, that uh, manifests at the national level. Um, so we, we thought about those issues and how they, where and when they're appropriate um, to have them in uh, trade discussions, um, but we recognize the very high importance of uh, data flows uh, to trade. Um, we then also uh, heard about some of the the regulatory uh, problems um, for policymakers in some developing countries and whether um, uh, sort of uh, standards or approaches like GDPR are the best ones uh, for them, and also how difficult it can be for businesses in some smaller markets to be able to uh, do uh, data-rich uh, business with uh, businesses in, in bigger markets. Um, and then we talked a lot about uh, sort of how to best coordinate around different approaches to data at different levels of, of global governance. And while on the one hand it may be great to sort of reach for, um, or some members in the group were, were very keen on sort of some, some global standards uh, for different aspects of data, other members in the group uh, were cautious and uh, thought that perhaps uh, some uh, 
other ways of coordinating might be um, as profitable a way to go. And we ended our conversation with uh, a call for uh, mapping different approaches, uh, trying to work out uh, which problems in, win in which sectors and which solutions are best and whether we can learn things from, for example, the, the financial sector or other, or other ways to sort of solve problems uh, for businesses in a smaller way, which mean that we don't have to solve everything at once. So yeah, we had a great group, really nice discussion. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'll give back the floor to you, Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Um, so let's turn next to, to Bertrand's group on jurisdictional and sovereignty issues. Well, I'm very, very sad to report that it was a very bad group. We had an absolutely inconclusive discussion, and the, mod, the, mod, the, the rapporteur will try his best to make sense of what we discussed. Now, it was actually really, really, really good. <laughs> and, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Yes, we had a very huge discussion about uh, two main topics, the um, two main notions, the notion of extraterritoriality and the notion of data sovereignty. And the common background is geopolitical balance, and so um, different needs from different countries, and of course the awareness that some countries, such as the United States, uh, are more uh, powerful in enforcing their own uh, <coughs> their own judicial uh, activities and enforcement activities. And uh, um, the main issue is about a sort of uh, universal or global framework uh, that, that is um, a rough consensus about the need of a global framework about these. And we have identified three general elements of this network or three general questions. The first one concerns uh, the general oversight of the system and of the quality and the effectiveness of the system. The second one is the, um, the role of companies uh, retaining data. And the third one concerns the, um, the, all the aspects about the suspects or the, the user, uh, the owner of the data uh, that are accessed by uh, authority. And um, we have also agreed that there are some second best solutions in the absence of a general framework or a universal framework. The first one is extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction, and so, but it is linked to power imbalanced between uh, among different nations, and we have mostly from the uh, global south opinions, uh, according to which. Um, there is already an extraterritorial effect and exercised by most powerful countries, and that this is this power relies on economic power. Um, and the, the, another point is that um, one solution is, uh, in absence of this general framework, is data localization. But it, of course, it, this is a very controversial uh, issue. I, I think that that's all. Thank you very much. Um, so then let's pass to Chennai. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Ben. We had a very interesting discussion with different stakeholders, and I will hand it over to Michelle, who is our rapporteur, to share our insights. I think we actually went through two of the questions, but we somehow made it to the third. Um, so our uh, group dealt with data protection frameworks and um, the various issues to be dealt with in developing such frameworks. So we mainly dealt with the first three questions. The first uh, question was, what is each party's role and responsibility in the process of personal information protection? Uh, including governmental agencies, um, civil societies, technical communities, private sector, and individuals. Um, so we got views from the various sectors. Um, from the government, um, those of you that the government's role and 
responsibility is to draft the initial bill and to involve all the various stakeholders um, in coming up with that draft bill and getting all the various views from the civil societies and the various actors. And um, that can be done through key debates and um, um, through using websites and um, through letter writing and through actually going to the various local communities um, to, act, to actually have face-to-face -face meetings with the communities to get their views. And the other issue we dealt with, uh, the other view that uh, was brought forward was that um, when you're looking at data, you don't need to look at it merely from the digital digital form because uh, data is not merely digital. And um, that um, digital, when you're looking at digital protection um, in the various jurisdictions, there is always an issue of the government um, shrouding data protection in secrecy. So it is hard for the civil societies to actually get involved in the discussion and um, have a clear view of um, what these bills of parliament actually intend. Um, so civil societies actually need to be proactive um, in getting involved with uh, the various laws and regulations in the various jurisdictions. And um, in terms of negotiating laws, there is a, um, a lot of compromise to be had with the government so that the government does not view civil society contributions as um, um, a push and pull issue. And um, another view was that um, when it comes to uh, developing data protection laws, um, issues should not merely be left to the lawyers and there should be a wider community involvement in order to get diverse views and uh, a more, comprehens more comprehensive laws, basically. And, um, and also that you can't put everything in the laws and it waters down into the regulations. And um, when you're talking about the individual level, coming down to the individual level, um, those of you that um, uh, most of these uh, digital protection issues are mainly left to the lawmakers and um, the framework should be phrased in such a way as to involve the actual individual. And um, further views were that um, individuals are not um, individuals are not uh, properly informed as to their um, what digital protection is about, and so the starting point in um, in the issue of digital protection is actually. To, um, to have a wider education of the communities so that when um, the issues of consent at individual levels and other issues related to that um, actually arise, um, the individual is already informed as to their needs. And the other issue was that um, the youths are the group that are um, mostly affected by data protection laws. Um, because data protection will affect them for years to come and the implications of the data that they put out um, is not really known to them at, at this stage. Um, so it is important that um, the, data, um, the data holders um, take that responsibility for themselves in um, securing that data because the person they are protecting doesn't really have that wider sense at the moment. Mm. And um, a view was put forward that uh, in the Philippines, um, um, they're, they're actually involving youth in the discussion to do with uh, data protection and getting the views of the youths and having ambassadors um, to discuss these issues and bring them to lawmakers. And so there's a wider discussion there. Um, and uh, another view was that um, 
looking at data protection from the human rights perspective um, is not uh, always convenient for the various jurisdictions because the various jurisdictions um, have different uh, human rights laws and principles um, and the applicability of the international human rights standards is not always even. So if you're going to restrict digital rights protection to um, the human rights framework, then it will not be, um, um, it will not be, um, what's the word fair? Uh, it will be interpreted differently in the various jurisdictions. And yeah, and um, it is used. Uh, and uh, another view that was put forward was that um, different people have uh, different levels of understanding and responsibility as to how that data is shared and used. And. Um, Let me just uh, go on to the second question because I think I've covered most of the first question. How much more so, time do I have? Well, let's leave enough time so we can go around the others. So um, I can touch base with you afterwards and we can put it in writing because actually um, the transcript will allow us to record and, and I can tidy up the reports back from each group but I can also touch base with you to kind of make sure we capture that second policy okay, question okay, as well. Okay, great, because there's a lot of information here. <laughs> sure. Well, let's. Let's make sure we, okay, we exchange yeah. business cards at the That'll end of the session. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michelle. You're welcome. Um, okay, so the next on our list, um, uh, Wyman with Data and Sustainable Development. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Um, the, the group we are at uh, is Data and Sustainable Development. We are uh, engaging uh, in uh, in-depth discussion uh, what's interesting is that uh, because of that subject, we actually not only touch upon substantive development, we did uh, also look into like data, AI and algorithm, human rights ethics, um, protection and, and regulation. Um, that just shows that the, 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 the relevance of this approach. So I'd just like to applaud uh, uh, Ben Wallace and, and Mac members for coordinating the discussion. That's, uh, so thank you for that. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, thank my, my repertoire, our repertoire, um, Amandi uh, Median, uh, Median Civic Tank Organization, who will give us some brief. Uh, I'm just going to keep it brief and uh, simple, right? So uh, the SDGs um, that were adjacent to data, man uh, data governance that we spoke about were mainly uh, access and uh, uh, economic growth. Uh, in terms of access, uh, we spoke about the need to build IDC infrastructure and uh, build up the digital skills of people in the uh, communities in the global south for them to be able to start generating data and manage that data uh, and fuel growth, economic growth out of that data. Um, we spoke that, unfortunately, um, data gaps uh, in many of the communities in the, the global south are some of the hurdles to achieve in economic growth uh, at the moment. We spoke about, um, obviously, there is uh, the need to uh, not have a one cookie cutter um, framework to manage and data, uh, always deferring uh, back to people who actually own the data. Uh, in that regard, we spoke about issues of data sovereignty, data localization uh, in countries like India, Kenya, uh, digital ID, and what does that mean, and how that actually, uh, if it is being misused, it may lead to uh, marginalizing communities. Um, we spoke about uh, uh, the need to actually come to a societal agreement to um, what managing data is, data, sorry, what governing data is, data governing is. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that was uh, br a brief summary, I think, of uh, what we said. Thank you. That's great, thank you very much. So, um, Contitina, on human rights and internet ethics. Okay, thanks, Ben. This is the group on human rights and internet ethics. We had a very good discussion, a wonderful group. We have, as moderator, Julia Granfield. 
And uh, we actually didn't have time to discuss all the three policy questions. We just under the first, uh, the first two. The first two. The first one is um, how can we strike a responsible balance between the prote protection of children and the participation rights of children, and who is responsible for the protection of children data, and how can we fill up any gaps of implementation? Julia, yes. about this point, they will give us uh, the bra 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 bra. I will try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm learning, thank you. Um, I'll try to sum up some of the discussion that we had today. So we're looking at this, firstly the responsible balance between protection of children and participation of rights of children. Uh, we had a discussion about how currently this can sometimes be done through the role of parental control and how this can be limiting for children in terms of learning, how technologies work, and how uh, data is transferred on platforms. So we t then kind of moved on to the importance of digital literacy. And we had some great examples of programs that are working to improve digital literacy for children and also adults. But that the importance of this being that we have these discussions at this level and then we move them towards uh, a national context as this is where a lot of the work needs to be done. But we had a general agreement that children should be part of the discussion when we're talking about participation of children on the internet and the fact that they be uh, available and uh, contributing to discussions like these today is fantastic and should continue. The second question was about uh, rights and permissions that various stakeholders have around citizen and consumer data. Julia? So, what rights and permissions should stakeholders have? Um, our discussion here was more around terms and conditions. And often there's kind of a phenomenon that people will see terms and conditions and just click yes without reading them. Particularly younger ages of uh, people, this is something they've grown up with and they're just very used to it. However, we're, we discussed potentially platforms taking a more GDPR approach to uh, distinguishing between functional type uh, cookies or functional type uh, agreements and the ones that are protect the business or to protect users so that people can understand um, do they need to agree to everything for this platform or for this uh, usage. So this could also allow different groups to collect feedback on which things people want to agree to. And that lastly, in the discussion of permissions, we talked about the level of language used and making sure this is accessible for all people using a specific uh, piece of technology. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, and, and Titi. Thank you very much. Um, so, the last one on the list, um, Maria Paz, on governance and ethics of AI and algorithms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mel. Uh, we have our fantastic uh, rapporteur, Jawari Carr from Panama, from Ipande Tech. So she will share the, the sense of our debate. Thank you. Um, good morning. Well, on um, the governance and ethics of AI and algorithms um, working group, we have three questions also. The first one it was, what possible frameworks could guide AI governance? What are the advantages and challenges of those based on fairness, accountability, and transparency, or, hum or human rights approaches? We have like a um, really good participation of different people from different um, sectors. So we have a representative of the UNESCO, and he said that they are um, from the UNESCO, they are developing a global framework on AI, that it will be uh, human rights centered, that will pass through a consensus of two years process in which everybody will have physical meetings and also online consultations, that they will set standards, instruments, and even recommendations. And uh, he said it's really important to know that it will be a consultative process from citizens to governments and private sectors and, of course, civil society, because there is not still a United Nations initiative um, regarding this topic. Um, he said that they have also met the Secretary General of the OECD uh, because he has developed principles. And the UNESCO will also, like, um, introduce these principles um, in their strategy or in this development process. And the idea is to share these different stakeholders and different partners to, to develop this. Um, so there was also a representative from University of Melbourne that she said that we need to we need more approaches to understand artificial intelligence and, there, and that there are huge imbalances and that human rights and um, artificial intelligence should also focus on job applications. 
and that there are many works and standards for things regarding AI and algorithmic decisions. And Maria Paz um, really had like a focus on a human rights approach because she said that uh, she stands for this kind of approach. Um, as an example, is to understand that AI and automatic decision-making systems are still acting inequalities around the world that because of structural inequalities. Um, so it's not sure if, if they can say that algorithmic systems are creating um, the bias, but surely the, these um, algorithmic systems are like boosting the bias. So the human rights approach um, she considered is like the most comprehensive because we can see how AI and algorit algorit algorithms help to exercise these rights. And in Latin America, because it's um, like our work field, um, there are policy systems and um, legislations that are applying just the technology, but they are not taking into consideration this human rights approach. So at least the civil society organizations have the intention of making this better and to improve this um, by, by suggesting to the governments or the, uh, or the policy making uh, people that implement this human rights approach. Um, and also, this human rights approach is about how can we apply a framework. One thing is how we build things, and another is how can we apply this in practice. Because all the issues of, because it is essential also to develop a human rights impact assessment. Uh, this has to be implemented at any process aside of economic benefits. Um, and this is necessary because it's like this kind of accountability because we're talking about a really close technology and it needs to be from the pretty beginning because if we don't do it from the pretty beginning, um, the consequences will be already there. Um, the results can be um, like really um, strong and at least the results in Latin, America, Latin American countries uh, also scares us because there is like an ethical constraint about making a deep assessment. It's about efficiency and what other impact could have. Um, there was also a discussion about that human rights framework doesn't mean that you're going to complete, completely avoid inequality because um, like the framework needs to be concrete on how it is going to be implemented. Um, because it has to orient in order to, pre in order to prevent those inequality implications rather than amplify them. That it's what's actually, that it's nowadays um, happening. There was a private sector um, person that also put into discussion the allocation of resources. Um, and that there are many types on how the, regulation, the regulator frameworks are made. And um, like we, are, we were also discussing about how the private sector can um, introduce these into their, into their daily work. And um, there's a guide principle of human rights and business that, could, that they could use to apply into their work for private sector. And the UNESCO says that there's, there are not still clear frameworks for application of AI in private sector. The second question was, what role should ethics, technical audits, design approaches such as human-centered and participatory co-design from concerned groups, impact assessments, or regulatory-based approaches play in AI implementation and governance? So um, this is about what ethics, design approaches, um, and the participatory policy models and impact assessment like play all together or you can be separate on the implementation of this decision making. It's how people that is working on this implement it, not just what kind of framework. Also how you integrate all the vision of the ways uh, uh, from people from different fields uh, that and how they understand it. Um, so we need to be more clear in this. And the UNESCO said that they will work with, uh, that th this is why they will work with different stakeholders and that the framework of human rights is not the only one that they will also introduce like ethical tools. Um, and also uh, another important thing is that we discussed like the, that the issue of data is also an issue 
that you need to look at from the regulatory framework, such as competition law, because many times the solution has to be provided as an issue that must be cross-border. Um, example is the benefit of uh, innovation and, and competition that could be linked with data and the interpre interoperability and portability. And the third question was about how technical or regulatory approaches can contribute to users' control over their own data and decentralized platforms. Um, so this question was about if you think, uh, if we thought that there was a value of the AI system that kind of manipulates our desires and decisions. And, well, we didn't could discuss a, lo a lot of these because it was the, the, because of the time, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, they, maybe we were too ambitious with three questions for each, for each group, because um, it seems um, you really were able to get into a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of depth with the discussions. Um, so I want to thank everyone who made this a truly interactive discussion this morning. I particularly want to thank the breakout moderators um, for leading the discussions and to the rapporteurs for capturing the essence of the discussions. So your reports just now have been um, recorded on the transcript um, and I'll also touch base with the, the rapporteurs to help us pull together a written summary of the discussions. And then that can then be um, provided as a reference document for the, uh, the sister session that we have on Friday. Um, if you think of it like a football match, we've just come to the end of the first leg and we'll return on Friday where we'll actually hear, hear back um, and how the discussions went during the week and how those relate to the policy questions that you've been discussing today. So we will make um, the reports back from today's breakout sessions available as a reference document on the uh, schedule page for the session on Friday. So um, that brings us pretty much to the end of the session. Um, thank you very much for being part of it today and for choosing to take part into the data governance discussions when I know there were many other um, equally large sessions going on at the same time. And uh, I'll call this session to a close. Thank you. up this morning but no I didn't party okay I, I didn't know so okay I, I, I went I went walking in the city but no we have we have dinner with the Swiss delegation so Okay. Bye. <laughs>
Uh, what do you can get downstairs, sir? 